route. Uh, many youth, uh, especially school-going children, were on record. We saw it on um, news on the television screens that they were caught engaging in some bad behaviors, amongst them um, taking drugs under the influence of alcohol and other substances as well. We now want to focus on this particular issue, and we've brought on board various individuals who, in their own right, are playing a part in ending this particular scourge. Allow me to introduce our panelists. I'll start with uh, Joseph Kabochi, who's joining us from our city center studios. He's better known as Countryman, and he's a recovered addict. He'll definitely be giving us his story and how he's impacting the local youth in his community to stay away from these vices, irrespective of uh, the circumstances in which they were brought up in. We're also joined by Joffrey Wango, who is a doctor, psychologist as well, joining us via way of Zoom. Many thanks for your time. He'll give us a psychologist aspect onto this particular scourge, even as we engage with Amos Kibara, who is from the Prudent Rehabilitation Center, talking to us as well on the work he does in terms of rehabilitating this particular youth or those who might come across his hands. Gentlemen, many thanks for your time. Kabochi, I'd like to begin with you as a recovered addict. I know your story is out there, but in case someone has hasn't had, I'd definitely like you to give us your take on your journey uh, towards recovery from drug addiction and perhaps a little bit of background into what might have pushed you into this particular uh, use of drugs. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my story started when I was 11 years of age, when my mother died and I was the only son, uh, she was a single mother. I was rejected by the extended family, whereby they told me that I don't belong to them. It's my mom who belonged to them. So from there, they left me alone in uh, uh, slums in Kawangwara, whereby I, I, I started experimenting with uh, uh, cigarettes, and since I didn't have anyone to guide me, and I, I felt a sense of belonging. And also, by being rejected, I wanted a comfort. Uh, I wanted to find comfort whereby uh, I could hide myself from all this pain. So that's how I got in into uh, smoking cigarettes. That was in class six. And then I got to graduate to um, marijuana, marijuana to alcohol. By the time I was completing class eight already, I was an addict. So even going to high school was an issue since that uh, no, no, I was just sponsored by uh, well wishes even uh, in my high school. I, I still had issues uh, to do with uh, um, smoking marijuana and smoking cigarettes and also uh, partly uh, drinking. And after I completed, uh, of course, high school, I, I came out as a person already who is addicted. Uh, I don't want to work, I want to steal. And from there, I got myself into troubles with the, um, the police in and out of prison and uh, to the point whereby I, I went out and, and to the point where by my life now oh, I was at stake. Uh, I even uh, started sleeping outside in the streets and I've spent you know, seven years sleeping in the, in the, in the, in the, in the cold in the streets. And from there now, I got deep into addiction, whereby I could not, uh, I, I was dependent on, on alcohol, I was dependent on uh, prescription pills, and marijuana was uh, my, my drugs a choice of choice. So I did do well in life. <laughs> For 20 years, uh, I've been up and down, up to the point whereby I decided to change, and this was after so many uh, painful experiences and, and hurt. And uh, mo most of my friends died, and uh, uh, I survived. I went to a rehabilitation program whereby, uh, this is 10 years ago, I went to a rehab whereby they, 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 they taught me on how to stay sober. I learned about uh, God and myself. I came to this point whereby I discovered myself, and uh, I changed my life. Now I'm 10 years sober and uh, helping uh, so many youths uh, to come back uh, to their senses, especially heroin addicts. Uh, the youths that are uh, in gangsterism, and the young ladies that are uh, uh, in, in this uh, work of uh, sex uh, uh, workers. So uh, that is uh, 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 my little bit of my story. 
Okay, quite interesting. And we'll definitely build up on your story. And perhaps congratulations for crossing that 10-year mark of being sober. Let me bring in Joffrey Wang, who's a psychologist. Uh, perhaps I'd be interested in picking your mind on what exactly goes on through their mind. Because if we can use Kabochi's story as a case scenario, um, rejection might have played a part. What are the triggers that might lead this younger generation into the abuse of substances. Thank you very much, KTN. And uh, I'm very glad that uh, Joseph can actually share his story because uh, there is a part of uh, drug and substance of abuse at the young people that we tend to neglect. And it has something to do with the frustration, the rejection, you know. We call them the four Fs. There is the frustration. There is the feeling better when the person is frustrated. There is the feeling good. There is the fitting in. What goes on in the mind of such a person when the family, for instance, and this is very unfortunate, rejects the very person who wants to feel loved in that particular family, in that particular community. The person actually feels that they do not fit in, and therefore they look for the drugs to fit in and feel good. Uh -huh. The person feels frustrated, and therefore the drugs and the friends, of course, the peer, the peers, because the, the peer pressure and, uh, comes with it and the friends, they make the person feel that you, we are part of you, we are joining you. We want to show you something better. And, and it's unfortunate also for Joseph because he, you, you notice that with due respect, and I like the way he understands himself, you graduate from one addiction to another, from cigarettes, you go to bangi, you go to hard drugs. And, and unfortunately, when we are not there as parents, as teachers, as pastors, as community, to assist the person. The person goes from worse to worse, you know, the, the, from, from, from the beginning, and the person progressively gets more addicted into this system that seemingly makes the person feel that we understand you, we care for you. In any essence, uh, and, and, and at all, these people don't give this person any hope. Because drugs actually don't give any person any hope. And I am happy that we are now getting into the brain of this person. And I am happy with the case of Joseph because what it tells us is this. We need to look at these people and ask ourselves, what goes on inside their minds? Why do they get into drugs? Why do we, why do we reject them? We need to make people feel better. We need to talk to the family. We need to talk to the teachers. We need to talk to the pastors. We need to talk to the community so that these people do not feel rejected by the very people that they want to feel loved, and by the very people who should be loving them, caring for them. And it is unfortunate that sometimes we go to that extent. Okay. Amos Kibara, I want to bring you into this particular conversation, even as you tell us of the work you do at Prudent Rehabilitation Center. One might beg to ask, what sort of cases might you come across in the rehab center? Give us a reality, a picture of what exactly happens within the center. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute to this uh, very noble talk on how to go about um, issues of dealing with issues of youth and drug abuse. Uh -huh. uh, I have been in uh, the rehabilitation industry for the last 15 years, and I think I have seen um, so many of cases ranging from uh, alcohol addiction to heroin addiction to bangi. And uh, I must also mention that the issue of uh, drug abuse always also come along with the issue of uh, mental illness and uh, psychological disturbances. And of course, when somebody comes, uh, shows up at, um, at the rehab center, they are coming in, and some will come in unwillingly. Others will come in with, um, uh, with a willing heart because they will have uh, maybe hit what we call the lock bottom when um, they have probably lost everything apart from their life, and that is what they are presenting to us in a rehab center. And uh, that is where we pick up from them. We are picking up from people who could be suffering from issues of uh, withdrawals. And uh, actually, it is important for me to mention that one of the one of the probably fears that people have when um, they are they, they they would have the cry and maybe a desire to recover from issues of drug and substance abuse. But when they think about the pain of going through the the the, uh, the withdrawal symptom, which is uh, the body reacting to the lack of uh, or the withdrawal 
withdrawal of the drug from their life, which mm -hmm. they have been learning on. Uh, some suffer a lot of, um, the, some will have what we call hallucinations, others will have nightmares, others will be shaking, depending with what um, maybe drug they could be withdrawing from. Yeah. And I think at this moment it is very, very important to say that uh, somebody don't have to lose everything apart from their life for them to show up in, uh, for a, rehab a rehabilitation process. Uh, one of the most important things, and one of the things I can reassure our reasoner this morning is that um, the issue of drug abuse, and I think uh, from what uh, our brother Kabochi has said, uh, at one time he was uh, he was he felt rejected and he went he found himself in the street there is nothing more until somebody probably came along for him and uh, through the rehabilitation center whereby the first thing that we usually do is the issue of um, uh, doing what we call uh, the detoxification or the stabilization of these individuals so can can be able to cope with the process of um, withdrawal and this is usually done medically because rehabilitation is a professional uh, process there are psychiatrists there are psychologists they are counselors. It's not just an issue of um, maybe having a counselor talking to somebody into recovery. Right. We bring in doctors, we bring in um, the whole process of uh, uh, medical intervention so that this person is, uh, is not uh, suffering the pain. And this is what most people fear. And okay. I would want to reassure them that uh, this, this, is a, this is a professional process and nobody should fear, irrespective of where they are in their process. Right. I think this is a place to turn to. So it's a concerted approach. A uh, direct question still to you. Um, how exactly has COVID-19 affected uh, the number of people who actually walk into the rehabilitation center, whether willingly or unwillingly? Have you noted a rise, a drop, uh, significant cases? Talk to us about this. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Absolutely. I think... Um one of, uh, one of the things I want to appreciate, or one of the things we would want to appreciate about us humans, there is a cycle of what we do every day. And uh, sometimes when that cycle is disrupted, and I think uh, COVID-19 did very well in disrupting the cycle of what um, each and every one of us knew. This is how I do it when I wake up in the morning. This is what I do on Monday. This is what I do on Tuesday. And mm -hmm. then when COVID came and disrupted that whole process, uh, it, we became unfamiliar to ourselves. And uh, we, 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 everything we knew what to do, it was no longer there. We didn't have a schedule. We didn't have um, uh, maybe a to-do list. You wake up in the morning. You are there and this becomes very unfamiliar ground for you to or maybe for most people to like uh, what is the next thing that I'm looking forward to and of All course right. with it it came it brought about issues of job losses and so many things and of course when so, a human being is in a process or in a situation whereby they are not in a, uh, they, they are not able to figure out exactly what to do uh, they might set to look for something that can be able to occupy or something and of course there will be uh, issues of stress that comes with it there'll be issues of um, some of the feeling like this is not familiar I need something to kind of uh, uh, calm me down because mm -hmm. you are thinking about your children are in the house your wife is in the house no income is coming in there is a lot of uncertainty going on into the future of what happens after this and I think one of the issues we realize is that um, so many people went now on overdrive all right uh, in, the, in terms of using their drug use and actually even in um, in the rehab center that I work in we realized and especially after after the lockdown was lifted, there was like um, so many people coming in because uh, they felt like, uh, no, I think we are losing it in terms of uh, COVID. And then uh, f many families felt we are also losing our loved ones when it comes to the issue of addiction. Okay. And okay. I think uh, that sense of disruption mm -hmm. from, uh, brought about by COVID-19, it kind of uh, accelerated the addiction processes to so many people. And others who have felt like, uh, I, this, I can't settle for this, they have turned up for rehabilitation. And I think I must report here. Yeah, on this national television that uh, so many people have come back to their senses on uh, this was not a good coping mechanism. Okay, countrymen, yes. even as we talk about this, I mean, we know it's easy to start and it's even harder to stop, but the best process is actually not starting at all. But let's speak to those youth who might be watching and who might be affected uh, by drug substance abuse. How exactly is it hard? How hard is it to stop, number one? And how often does relapse happen? Perhaps you can borrow from your particular case as well. Yeah, the, the best thing uh, to deal with uh, drug or alcoholism is uh, before it begins. So, and it begins with our thoughts. It begins by what we take in. 
from what we watch, from what we listen. Even nowadays, the music that we listen, the youth listen nowadays, actually promotes uh, drugs uh, and, and sex. So you find that we become what we continually watch, what we continually um, uh, listen. And uh, the information that we have nowadays is so much uh, uh, corrupt. And, and people don't think, especially youths, what to take in, what to sieve, and, 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 and work uh, uh, with the information that is right. So uh, even for me, from, for me, uh, by, by where I work, I work in a rehabilitation program. Uh, even parents, parents, parents are part of the, uh, uh, the bigger problem. Sometimes uh, we, we don't uh, want even to, to say about it because the lifestyle uh, of the parents also um, inter interrupts with the, you know, helps he the, the way you live as a parent also determines how your kid uh, gonna choose on how to live uh, even in their lives. So the behavior and the words of a parent also matters in the life of their kids. How you live as a parent also uh, may promote or may also discourage uh, the kids from getting into uh, that life of uh, drugs or alcoholism. And uh, you know, when you start doing drugs or alcohol, uh, there is an agreement that you have to sign with those things because uh, for me, I, I didn't know that getting there was easy, but coming out was very hard. There is this agreement that, uh, uh, that, that we usually even tell people that when you get into drugs, that in a, uh, this agreement of uh, you are free to begin, but not always free to quit. So quitting has been a challenge to me, but uh, after so much pain, after so much of interaction with people trying to help me, and also deserving to change, admitting that I had a problem, that actually took me to a rehabilitation program. And sometimes uh, the addict may deny that uh, they don't have a problem. Uh, and this now has to do with parents. When an addict says that they don't have a problem, of which they have, and they're denying it, you try and create a, uh, an environment whereby they are able to see themselves by talking to them, uh, pointing on the truth, and also trying to um, um, involve other people in so that those people can know that they have an issue that they need to be helped. Even parents nowadays, they promote uh, the, the, a condition called enabling. They promote the, the habit by offering the wrong kind of help. Uh, a codependent is a, is a problem whereby a parent uh, takes in ownership of the problem and trying to fix the problem of that person uh, by trying to control uh, their problem by providing, you know, uh, even the money, the things that the person lacks, you know, trying to pro, uh, give some kind of love, uh, but which actually uh, spoils the person instead. So I don't know if I have answered uh, your question or... Yes, you have in totality, I must say, but I still want to go back on that issue of relapse because uh, it's not always uh, smiles, yes. especially in, in the journey towards recovery. Talk to us about the struggle with relapsing, especially. Briefly, sir. Yes, yeah. you, you see, even rehabs, yes. Uh, uh, it's me, yeah? Yes. Man. yes, continue. Okay, yes, I, I'm, I'm saying uh, not so many rehabs deal with the, uh, or the whole person. You know, they say there is uh, the, the psychological, the mental, the physical, but uh, uh, they miss the aspect of the spiritual. I work in a faith-based organization whereby we deal with the spirituality, we deal with the mental, the, the, the psychological, and, and as, as, as a whole. Uh, of a person, uh, and, and I think it's like having a table, a table uh, with, the f with three legs and missing one part. Uh, most of the rehabs don't deal with the spiritual part, and actually they lead people into even another, uh, 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 
another dependent of depending on anything that you can call a spiritual thing. We, we still have a, a higher power, which is God. And, and, and most of the, like me, for me, the, the way I changed, I, I looked at, at, at God and, and discovered myself, a sense of purpose, why I exist on earth. So that came to me as a real thing, and, and that's where I found my, my change. So relapse is real, it's part of the process of uh, changing. So people can't know, uh, they, uh, they still need help if they don't even fall, uh, 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 when they don't relapse. So if people think that uh, uh, they are able to make it, even in rehabs, people would think that they are able uh, even to spend, uh, to, to be there for three months, and then they will be good, everything is okay. And uh, I tell you, it's not always like that. You think that the life is going to change and expectations are so high. So you end up uh, going out of the rehab and you find yourself things are not the same. So you, there, there must be some uh, attitude change. There, some, there, there has to be some mental change, not only being in rehab, because we have the dry relapse and also we have the wet relapse. Dry relapse has to do with your thinking the attitudes that you have gathered about life and problems, how to solve your uh, life issues. And now that leads to wet, uh, to wet relapse, whereby now you are able to, to drink. It has to come with attitude first, and then you go to the real thing. So relapse is, um, is part of the process, but we don't remain there. We still look for solution even after relapses. Okay, Let, let's cross over to Dr. Wango right now. Uh, before we talk to you about the relapse process, um, talk to us about the triggers. What specific triggers might lead um, young people into using drugs? Do parents play a role in getting their children addicted or it's just simply social pressure? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I like my two colleagues, the, the fact that uh, we are talking about existentialism, it is actually a trigger. We need to ask ourselves, what is a human being looking for? A human being looks for satisfaction. A human being looks for ways to live their life in a fulfilling way. So they are looking for the psychological fulfillment. They are looking for the physical fulfillment. They are looking for spiritual fulfillment. They want social fulfillment. So it is possible that as, they, as, as these human beings are going on, they are actually trying to make their lives as comfortable as possible. And that is why you have mentioned the relapse. What happens to a young person when they are, in, they are going through life? The first part of it is that they want to find, who, to find out who they are. They, they want to find out their place in the world. And that is why the rejection that uh, Joseph mentioned at the beginning becomes a very important trigger. Because you see, the, human, the, the, the young person, the young boy, the young girl, sometimes 12, 13, 14 actually, as just beginning with their adolescence, they are trying to ask themselves, who am I in this world? Where do I fit in? And as they are trying to find out who they are, they encounter this environment, and that's why I'm happy that they keep mentioning the environment, where the father or the mother or the teachers and the other members of the community, including relatives, yeah. do not make this person feel that you are a part of us. So the person feels, I'm rejected. I am disappointed. The person becomes disillusioned. And that's why I've liked the two, because they both mentioned the, the experience comes with the rehabilitation. Because we must ask ourselves, what is the process of addiction? The process of addiction begins with a discomfort or inability to deal with issues in our lives. As the inability uh, becomes worse, or as, uh, as our lives become more impossible, we look for something to relieve ourselves. In fact, addiction is actually starts as a habit, just the way we take water. And that's why uh, I was looking at the statistics that you are giving, and it is true. Cigarettes is the most abused drug, of course. And then, and, and, and it, of course, it turns out to tobacco and, uh, and banky and uh, alcohol and other hard drugs. Why? Because the first thing is that the person goes for a quick relief. Quick relief is, how can I quickly get over my problem? Okay. So the person actually moves in. And that is why uh, I, I like the way the, the two mentioned aspect to do with uh, our physical well-being, our spiritual well-being, our psychological well-being, our emotional well-being. Because at that point in time, 
the persons in the immediate environment, the teacher, the peer, the colleague, the spiritual leader, the parent, a quick alternative, and us in society can intervene. We can tell this person we love you, we care for you, you are here with us. What is going on? And we can also notice patterns in this person's life that are not working as well. We can notice that, for instance, a student is not performing as well. If it is a person who is working, an adult, of course, you will notice that the person no longer goes to work. The person is neglecting their family. So we can see the telltale signs, as we call them. Okay. And that is why we can also notice the two relapses that they are talking about. Because the person can get relief and stop at some point. But if the person does not receive help, the person goes back to the habit. And the second relapse can be worse than the first than the addiction itself because the person may not go back that route. All right. And that is why we should aim not just at rehabilitation, but at making the person not get addicted at, in the first place. Okay. Amos Kibara, even as we talk about the importance of well-being, physical, spiritual, emotional, and all that, the process of detoxing must be quite important in this journey of rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about this. Um, I must appreciate um, the, the, the very, uh, very informative, um, actually, uh, explanation that my colleagues in the show has given. And I think that is very, very, that is very, very good and very commendable so that our audience can be able to understand uh, how to go about and even understand actually the whole issue of um, uh, drug abuse. When it comes to the issue of um, uh, detoxification, uh, like I said earlier on, the body, the body of an addict or the body of an alcoholic actually learns on alcohol. And uh, I think it would be important to mention that uh, our bodies learn on water, but, we, but our bodies don't produce water. Therefore, our bodies must always be given water because they learn on water, but they don't produce. Our bodies learn on food, but they don't produce food. Therefore, there will always be a trigger in the brain that tells or informs the body that I am hungry mm -hmm. and I need food. In the same way, when somebody is, uh, has been now gotten into issues of addiction, uh, when the body is not given what it is asking for, in this case, if it is in alcohol because there are respective chemicals in every drug that people abuse, uh, those chemicals, when they get into the brain, there is a way they will create their own uh, artificial kind of call centers whereby they will be informing the body, I am thirsty for or maybe I'm having a craving for alcohol, I'm having a craving for mira, I'm having a craving for this and that. And uh, when we talk about detoxification is now whereby we are helping the body to come to terms okay. with the fact that uh, you, can do, you can do naturally without the issue of depending on this thing. And that process is usually done uh, by, by psychiatrists. These are um, uh, mental professionals. Uh, who have uh, the capacity to know this person is withdrawing from uh, alcohol, this person is withdrawing from uh, heroin, this person is withdrawing from this, and they will put these people on um, specific medications. And when it is done, that is now the, 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 the medical aspect. And then there is also what we call the social detoxification. Social detoxification is whereby we are getting these people from a, a very toxic environment. We are now bringing them in a very... Uh, in, a, in a stable environment, in a controlled environment called rehabilitation center where there is issues of love. I like the way uh, Dr. Wango and uh, my brother Joseph has explained it very well that these people are looking for love. So when they come to the rehabilitation centers, like uh, at Prudent Camp where I work, we, mm -hmm. the first thing, right from the admission, we are helping this person to now know that you are no longer in a process or, or maybe in a situation whereby you'll be harassed. We are welcoming this person, we are calling this person sir because we want to start helping this person perceive himself or herself differently from where they are coming from they have been mishandled they have been rejected they have been kicked out they have and as we take them through the process of even the admission and uh, explaining to them what we do and helping them know how we want them to cooperate with us in helping them that whole process is uh, is a part of the social detoxification and then there are there are other people who are in the rehab who have um, gone before this particular individual okay and when they come in you realize that these people who have probably been there before maybe like uh, for two weeks or a month or they are just about maybe to finish their program they are usually very happy to welcome the new admits uh, who are coming in because it's like uh, somebody treated them well and of course they have learned through the program 
that uh, this person is suffering, this person could be coming in unwillingly, this person could be coming in without, um, uh, maybe without uh, so much hope, they didn't uh, leave anything out there that they would say, once I'm done with this program, be going back to this. Okay. So the issue of giving, somebody giving, like a, a shoulder to lean on for this particular individual is a part of what we call the social detoxification, that sense of reassurance. And I think it is important to say, because this is a very, very critical uh, part, and it, I think I would also want our viewers to understand this. There is what we call the 12 steps program. And in step two, we talk about, uh, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Okay. And I think that process of being restored to sanity, it is very, very important to acknowledge God. And actually in my rehab, every morning between um, 9 and 10, we, we have the Bible. We don't shy away from confessing that only God can fix an addict in totality because anything else apart from uh, uh, other people will talk about willpower, but willpower actually is not a very good strategy mm -hmm. to fix an addict who is suffering, who is rejected, who have uh, everything around their lives has been broken, their relationship, their okay. financial life. So I think the issue of um, that fear, maybe going back to what you had asked uh, about the issue of detoxification, yeah. let everybody who is listening this morning, could it be a family member, could it be a, maybe an employee, an employer who is uh, minding about their employee, or maybe a family member who is wondering what can I do? There is, the, the, the science has come in and has really helped us to know how do we handle the issue of people suffering Okay. from withdrawal and help them now start on a journey towards their absolute freedom from addiction. Okay, yes. but even as we speak about science, Kabochi, the intentional um, approach, that particular addict must have the willpower, the want to, you know, disassociate himself from this particular use of uh, substance. But the society definitely has a role to play. Earlier on, you picked up about how we glorify bad values. I'm pretty sure the media might be in the spotlight for promoting this as well. But talk to us about the link between the society, drug abuse, and all this degenerating into crime. Uh, okay, the society plays a role by how, how they live. Uh, for example, uh, according to me, it's how I saw people smoking and I admired that habit. So the society, how you live as an adult, how you live as you as a person actually affects another person's uh, decision. On, on what uh, that thing m might mean to you. So the, even kids, they actually follow uh, a person. The behavior is learned, and it, does, it is not learned in, you know, in emptiness. There has to be somewhere they have, uh, 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 like, uh, 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 they have learned from. So um, well, what I'm saying is that the society also should see uh, an addict as a person that needs help, a person that is not beyond change. You know, sometimes we say that person cannot change, but that's not true. Sometimes the situation might look hopeless, but it's not always like that. For the people that I reach to are the most uh, people who are in extreme, like there are people who are in uh, um, the level of extreme especially the heroin addicts, the people that are in gangsterism, and the women that are in prostitution. Uh, for us as a society, we tend to condemn them instead of uh, trying to think how can I become a solution to these problems. So instead of the society now becoming an, uh, a solution, they become a source of judgment, and that uh, pushes that person more and more to the habit or the, the drug that that person is relying on. So we need to think as a, um, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a way that uh, God also thinks that uh, uh, about love. We have to love uh, people unconditionally. If we love people without putting any condition on them, then that helps us to see them as the way God sees them. And for me, that's what I do. I, I don't see people as prostitutes. I don't see people as uh, uh, gangsters. I, I don't see them as uh, a drug addict. I see them as people who have given in to the control of a chemical. And their lives have become hopeless. Now I need to help them 
to change that mentality and it is a process you have to be there with them you have to show love for them you have to be there those who don't want to change those who don't want to admit they have a problem they still have hope because you keep on you keep on telling them that this is possible you can be able to change you are you, you are loved you see you have a lot of potential in you so uh, from there these people might change the way they think because addiction is, is a mental conditioning so when I go there, I don't only focus on the physical uh, issue on, on drug use, but I, I focus on the mind of that person. How do I help this person to think differently? And when the mind changes, then we know the, uh, the outside of a person changes. Changes and your actions definitely will follow. Dr. Wang. Am I done? Uh, yeah, you, you have a different point. You want to continue? Yeah, yeah. So, so the behavior change, the behavior okay. change does only come from does not only come from 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 counseling. From you know, there, there is a lot that need to be replaced in an addict's mind. Uh, because uh, the way they think about uh, drinking, the way they think about alcoholism, the way they think about solving problems. So many people walk aimlessly in rehabs and they come out as hopeless as they got in. And you see, even some rehabs, they actually do business. They, they don't care whether you change or not. They don't spend too much time with this person. And you see, like the ones in the street, they don't have anyone, anywhere to go. They don't have money. So you find that we still need so many uh, people uh, so many people, so many people to come out and help as many people as possible because the ones that are in the street, they are the ones that help the ones in the houses uh, to begin the, 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 these processes, uh, these experimentation processes. And, and I, I think uh, for me, I've played a part. And I'm thinking that uh, if, even, even opening uh, some other organization that can also help us uh, even in learning, we can also, we want to, to, to have this much of uh, uh, learning, we want to be trained, we want to, to, uh, to know about uh, like the way the, the psychiatry uh, and the, the other colleagues are uh, mentioning. We, we need a lot to train people on the issue to do with the drugs and how to deal with addicts in a, in a, in a professional way. Okay, professionalism is important. Dr. Wango, I mean, we live in an age where society might glorify these vices in one way or the other. And definitely, it's a sign of the times, a political heat. The youth might get um, allude to the fact that, you know, I give you 500 shillings or a bottle of uh, something to drink and you will push my agenda. The susceptibility aspect of the young people in society, not just to drugs, but to other vices that might emanate from the use of drugs. Talk to us about it. How do we, um, as, as an addict, how do I differentiate myself from a society which might glorify or which might condemn me for, for what I do not necessarily help or point me in the right direction? I, I, I really like your question because uh, you've picked on two major aspects actually. The first one, and, and you also related to, to related to young people. Actually, it's interesting that uh, drugs are actually, like you said, associated with the crime, with the prostitution, with the gangsters, ah, abandoning school, truancy, and all the evils. So on one hand, drugs are actually evil. But on the other hand, they are used by people for their own good. People want to be rich, people want to make money. And when you want to make money, one way to make quick money is to sell drugs. And that's why drugs are also associated with prostitution, with the pornography, with the sexualism. In fact, uh, uh, at one point when Joseph was speaking, he talked about what we see, you see? So when you see a movie and you see someone smoking and they look uh, meticulous, they look spread it, the, the young people see the, 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 the extent of the living happily that is there. But there's another aspect that is on the opposite end of it. And that is, we actually stigmatize people who are addicted. Mm -hmm. it, it is it's very unfortunate that we don't tell young people the two. We actually uh, lure them to the, 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 the world of luxury, magnificent, you know, fantasy of drugs, the pornography, the drugs, the guns, and everything. 
but we don't tell them that on the opposite end, we actually stigmatize them. And that is why I like this debate, because parents watching out there, people watching out there, should be knowing that despite, uh, we do respect the internet and the media, and again, we also still need to use the media to change, and the internet, the, the, this world is not real. And that is why when you look at some of the music, I actually sometimes sit back and I take sometimes even one or two hours on the internet. And you see some songs. The song has some people taking, uh, drinking several bottles of alcohol, smoke. Uh, there's, uh, there's all the types of cigarettes. And you see, for young people, when they see this, they see the growth of it. They see a new world, an elevated world, a world with no problems. But remember, this world means one does not work. So at one point, I completely agree with you that the, the drugs actually uh, make the young people believe that there's another new world. But on the other hand, the young people actually can fail and miss out on the fact that they are left out. And now that, that takes us back to rehabilitation. Okay. That's why I really like my friend from the rehabilitation center, because he picks the two. There is need to look at this intoxicated person. But what intoxication, uh, intoxication is going on? This is where now you go back to Joseph. What went on initially? And this is where the parents and our of us looking, we must ask ourselves, where do we begin? We must get this person not addicted in the first place. Okay. But if the person gets addicted, then we need to assist the person. You see, assist now are brought in the issue of stigmatization. By the way, we are a traditional set. You know, for, for us, even when someone dies of a road accident, the first thing we say is that you caused it by crossing the road at that point in time. You should have waited for the car to pass. And that's the same thing that happens with drug and substance of abuse. All right. our, our, our first instinct is, why did you get into them? How did you go into that path? It was your work. But you don't look, want to look at several things that you have mentioned, for instance. How is this one lured into this? Okay. The role of the media, the parenting and shaping. So we must balance the two. We must balance the society luring young people into all this with an education, a psychosocial educational system that makes these people not, be, not get into the habit of addiction and therefore live fulfilling life. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Uh, Amos Kibara, even as you build up on what the other panelists have just mentioned, I mean, the rehab is definitely a key component in this particular journey, but there must be challenges, uh, not just on your side, but the particular person who's walked into the rehab, whether willingly or unwillingly. Highlight to us the various challenges that might come up during this particular stage of the journey towards rehabilitation. Okay, I think that's a very good question. I appreciate. Um, there, there are quite a number of challenges. There are quite a number of challenges. And uh, one of, um, for somebody who has uh, come in, into the rehab center, one, uh, there will always be the issue of uh, loss and grief because this person is coming from what is so familiar to them. They are coming from a background whereby they have understood and they have known that all the friends they have, all their networks, all the, uh, everything about them actually it is from a world that has been so familiar to them, could be for 10 years, could be for 20 years. And now they are coming into an environment whereby whatever it is that we are starting to tell this person that this is a better way to live their life, it is so unfamiliar. It is like, uh, I do not know how to live in the new world that you are calling me up to. Mm -hmm. And I think that is usually one of uh, the first loss, loss kind of uh, process that this person feels. I would wake up in the morning and I had my own uh, process of uh, when I wake up in the morning, I will, um, uh, what they say, kutoa rock and tatoa rock, and then I will hang out in the base with my friends and all that. And when this person comes in, one of the challenges is that uh, we are teaching him, and of course you are teaching um, maybe a 30-year-old, a 40-year-old, a 50-year-old, the issue of like uh, you have lived a certain life that we want now to call you out of it. The issue of letting that sink in that uh, I am going to make new friends. Because, of course, uh, if, let's say, for example, in my case, 
so many people that are in my social network. There are people that probably I got to church with them or um, we went to school with them or they are my colleagues at the place of work. We have something in common. And for this person who is now coming into recovery, this person has his own network. And uh, most of them, they are actually formed around people that they used to gather with. And uh, that challenge of overcoming that, I find it to be one of the greatest handle. Okay. Uh, once they have now been able to, after the detoxification, which is now the process of uh, the body struggling to come to terms, where now it hits home, the other challenge is the issue of, uh, and where do I start? And especially when it comes to uh, issue of uh, many things that they have done. Mm -hmm. You hear about uh, a man uh, who went and harvested maize at the center of uh, their, their shamba they don't want to do it from the science because the wife will know and probably that you create a problem. When this person is now coming to terms with their past, in fact, you think of a man like me, a grown-up, I have a, a, a wife and I have children and then I go at the middle of my Shabbat at night and I'm harvesting the green maize and I pass through a certain route, uh, take it to the market, or maybe I storm into my wife's uh, granary or whatever store and I kind of take away two debits of maize and okay. I take it to the portion mill mm -hmm. and I am given some cash. Coming to terms with some of those things, it is usually a challenge to these people. You always see them shaking their hands and saying, I should have known better. Because addiction, actually, we say, uh, the issue of using the drug that is 10% of what is addiction. But right. addiction has so many other things if we use like the, what we call the iceberg principle. There are so many other things below the waters that we can't see. And this is the struggles that are um, the issue of this person having been rejected. How do I come back and how do I address, how do I face a family that I have taken through so much turmoil. But now the good thing on these challenges of um, the body heart is withdrawing, the issue of um, my social and how do I adjust my life now so that I can uh, uh, understand how to come to this new platform of executing my life, okay. the issue of coming to terms. These are things that we deal with actually in the program now, helping this person to know how do you forgive yourself. We do, there are, there are some things we call the inventory or stock taking whereby we take them through the process of coming to terms with um, what their life has been, uh, things that they need to kind of uh, forgive them about, things okay. they need to forgive others about, right. issue of making amends to people that they have offended in their lives. And we also, I think it's also important to mention that we also encourage and we do bring in the family okay. because the family therapy is very important. We usually say that when somebody is in addiction, it's like a car. And you know when a car has one tire that is flat, it can't move. Definitely, and yeah. it's the same way that when one person in a family is sick, the whole family is sick. And bringing them on board is usually very important okay. so that we can take them through the process of healing alongside their loved ones so that at the end of the day, okay. everybody knows this is my place, this is how I support him, and they can be able to come to terms. All it right. is behind us now, and we are starting on a new platform. Okay, coming to terms, and I like us, even as we conclude on this particular conversation, Bochi, taking stock is important, but one definitely has to open up, uh, be willing to talk truth to reality, perhaps by accepting that they need help in that particular area of substance abuse. It might not be too easy, especially for men, um, whether young or old, opening up that particular aspect and accepting that I might have a problem that needs the help, not just me, but society, from anyone who might actually afford some help. Talk to us about the reality, coming to terms with the reality that I might be hooked to this substance, but there might be a little bit of rejection that no, this I, I don't need help at this particular point. Do you come across this when you're interacting with people on the ground? Yeah, definitely. Uh, that is one of the signs to show that a person needs help. Because in the process of addiction, that one is called denial, not in line with the truth. And continuous denial leads to delusion. Now they don't recognize the truth anymore about themselves. So there is this, um, you know, uh, you ha as a person, like, uh, as a relative or someone who is close, to that uh, loved one, they have to continue confronting this person with the truth because this person has been living in lies. Uh, they tell themselves lies about how they see things, 
uh, socially, you know, have, as I told you, the, the mental conditioning. So there is a lot to be done by the people who are around them. And uh, as for me, I, I, I keep on confronting these people with the truth uh, about themselves. I don't speak too much on the, um, the substance, but I talk too much on, on about their potential. Uh, their purpose and their position in life and who they can be uh, in the society. So um, it's not an easy thing to try to resurrect a person's mentality uh, which has been uh, uh, oppressed uh, or is being controlled or dominated by chemical. And um, uh, from there, we are able to win them. Now, when I go to the street, I'm able to win them physically by talking to them so that they are able to admit that they have a problem and they would want help. Now I take them to a rehabilitation prog program whereby they need now to unlearn all the things they have learned in their mind and now we replace them with the truth. All the lies has to be replaced with the truth uh, because it has to come out um, uh, clear that they were living um, a destructive lifestyle, self-destructive lifestyle, and now they need to live a life whereby they are able now to build their lives and they have so much in them uh, that uh, doesn't need to be destroyed by the way they used to live. So um, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a work in itself, but also it's a work on the other side of the person who is helping an addict. Okay, well, that's definite. Uh, Dr. Wango, I'd like your final remark, but even as you give us, um, you give us your final remark, the importance of a support system in this particular journey, even from a psychological aspect, it shouldn't be a solitude journey, should it? Mm. Thank you. Um, Amos and Joseph have mentioned uh, continuously on the need to rethink about our lives. And uh, you notice, I like the way you use the word dissolutionment and adjustment. In fact, in positive, uh, in modern psychology now, we use a word called positive psychology. Why positive psychology? We are trying to say people need to live more fulfilling lives. And that is why you notice we are looking at addiction differently. Unlike other people who want to look at addiction in terms of people who are who have problems, issues, and all that. Mm -hmm. We are looking at it positively. What is positive psychology? We are asking ourselves, people need to live more fulfilling lives. They need to adjust, not just to life, but also to the challenges of life. Okay. It is true. Life has challenges, but we need to get up at it, and we need to live more fulfilling lives. We need to make our children live better. We need to make our families live better. We need to think about our lives in a more positive way so that we can be happier, and also, we don't make too many mistakes because actually getting into addiction like drugs is a major mistake and we need sometimes to get out of it. But at the end of the day, we need to ask ourselves how we can live more fulfilling, happy lives so that we are well and psychologically, fulfilled, psychologically socially, emotionally, and spiritually fulfilled. Thank you. Okay, that's really proper. Many thanks, Dr. Ari, right there. Amos Kibar, I'll cross over to you. Your final remarks and perhaps speak to an individual who might be affected back at home. Um, how exactly might they start seeking help? Uh, thank you. Thank you for an opportunity to make my final remarks. And I want to start by saying, um, two days ago, there is a mother who came to my office and uh, she was accompanied by um, a 14-year-old. Mm -hmm. And this 14-year-old was carrying a bag with him. And inside the bag were quite uh, several packages of uh, tobacco. There is Kubel in there, quite a number of drugs that um, were lapped up and uh, he came with it. And uh, it was the evidence of uh, why he had actually been expelled from school. Okay. And he came to me and I sat with him and I asked him about uh, what is going on. So when we went into uh, in the therapy room and I was talking to him and I kind of uh, wanted him to feel secure in addressing the issue. Uh, he told me that um, I am making money out of this process because this young man has been recruited by some young fellows who are uh, not young fellows per se, but uh, being a 14-year-old, he has been recruited that uh, he can be used as a vehicle that takes these drugs from one point to point B without being suspected. Okay. And uh, I was asking this young man, and 
then what next? I am making a few money. And I was asking, how much money do you make? And he was saying they would pay me sometimes 200 to ferry to several places. And I looked at that and I thought, uh, extending 10 years of this young man's life, because he himself, he has been using these things, of course, out of curiosity. He has been carrying these things with him and testing some. And uh, looking at that and what um, so many things going on there, I think I want to make my first uh, appeal to a parent like myself and others who are tuned in, mm -hmm. that uh, we are what we do most of the time, and we are what we eat. And for that I want to mean, or I want to appeal, that um, we need to know and we need to be involved in our children's lives. Okay. And we need to be there, not for, not in a part-time basis, not, not to come, uh, maybe not to be so busy, out there doing so many things that uh, we think that uh, this is a real deal. Because our real investment, actually, when we have looked back into our lives, I okay. think we will see it reflected in our children. Therefore, my appeal okay. is that uh, those of us who have uh, young children, children cultivate a relationship so you can be able to know. Yeah. At the same time, I also want to make an appeal for those of us who are uh, in uh, maybe leaders in the society. You are a pastor, you are a reverend, you are a sheikh, whoever you are. Just know that the person suffering with issue of addiction could be sitting in your congregation. That person could be the person that works for you. And how can you be able to mitigate this by opening up opportunities to professional like us who can be able to also do above all, apart from just maybe looking at curative aspect of it, we okay. can also do preventive by right. uh, talking about these things in schools, in churches. And for those who are addicted, I've okay. been come out and accept that I am in addiction and I need help. Reach out to the family and let the family help us. Okay to get through the issue of addiction. And I think uh, that way we can be able to address the issue of addiction. For right. now, those are affected and those who could be falling into it through uh, probably being lured into it and maybe using it as a coping mechanism. Well, what yes. a way of driving the point home. Many thanks. Uh, Amos Kibara right there from the Prudent Rehabilitation Center, of course, working hands-on with those who might be affected. We're also joined by Joseph Kabochi, better known as Countryman from our city center studios, a recovering addict who also plays a part in you know pushing the narrative that drug abuse is not the right way to go dr joffrey wango also joining us by way of zoom psychologist we, gen we gentlemen we appreciate your input right here and talking about this particular issue that effect that affects the social um, construct of this particular society to stay with